Suna Baba, protectors of the Suna. Suna Baba, protectors of the Suna. Alhamdulillah, wassalam, wassalam Allah, wa rasulullah. Welcome to another session of Sunnah Followers Tawhi class. And for this series, we are discussing how to conduct the Islamic funeral. And we've covered the particulars that, re that relate to the Islamic funeral. The funeral prayer consists of, of no rakats at all. It's just supplicating to Allah for the deceased. And it's preferred to stand in three rows because the prophet said any uh, Muslims who supplicate for a believer who dies and they make up three rows, Allah will accept the supplications. Women can attend funerals. We've given the clear evidence on that. Why is it that you have men today, Islamic communities today, stopping women from coming to the funeral? I don't know, but you tell them they can't stop you, especially if it's someone who is close to you. Because as long as the, the person attending the funeral, be he male or be she female, conducts himself with dignity, there is no stopping. The prophet allowed the women to attend the funerals. He allowed the women to go to the cemetery during his time. And who are you to think that you know better than a prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So we've covered uh, basic information about the funeral prayer, how it's conducted, the what can we can't do, the things that we can do. And yesterday uh, we spoke about some of the things that are forbidden for us to do in regards to the funeral. And let me put the quiz up on the screen. I did post a quiz on Facebook. Everyone should have reviewed it on my um, Facebook page. Let's look at the first question here. Question number one. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbade us from being loud on three occasions. What are those three occasions and explain them? And this is something that Muslims need to understand. We live in the days of fitna, the days of fitan that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about occurring the days in which Islam has become strange and distorted, the days in which the Sunnah has become abandoned and replaced by other ideologies and other opinions. For example, you have a lot of Muslims today who will tell you that if a woman such as Layla Nasheba has a loud voice and I'm a witch and I'm going to hell, there is nothing in Islam that says that. In fact, Allah commands us. Allah says, oh, you women who believe, when you speak publicly, speak with a strong, direct voice. Do not be soft in your speech. So I'm obeying Allah. But then again, that's why I'm strange, because I live my life obeying him. Okay, but however, there are three instances or three occasions in which Muslim women and men are not to be loud. What are the three instances or the three occasions in which Muslim women and men are not supposed to be loud? Who can give us what those three are and explain them? Explain each one. Don't just say, uh, one, two, three, and that's it. No, you better explain it. Okay, who like to answer this? And I know there's not that many people here listening. Don't make me have to call on y'all, please. Somebody uh, take the mic. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi, are y'all supposed to be memorizing the meaning of these hadiths we go over in classes? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbade us from being loud on three occasions. What are those three occasions and explain each? 
anyone. Sister Awa, Sister Anissa, Sister Faiza, Sister Hawa, Sister Ikra, Sister Kim, Sister Latifa, Sister Sabrine, Brother Tarek, Sister Yasmin, Zaytun. Okay. Can somebody well, answer? Assalamualaikum. Well, they are three. There are three. Uh, the companions disliked raising the voices on three occasions. One was at the funeral procession, because at a funeral procession, we should be quiet. That's how I be, so we should be quiet. And when you're remembering the law, when you're remembering the law, you're knowing you're quietly remembering the law is better and more helpful for your concentration. And when you're on the battlefield, and what goes on on the battlefield, I don't remember that one. But I know it's the battlefield. Okay, well, mashallah, she gave us the answers here. You know, the prophet forbade us from being loud on three occasions. Number one, when you're accompanying the funeral procession. We talked about how before uh, the prophet received the message uh, uh, of, of a law, the Arabs used to pay women. They used to pay women to walk in the back of the line, uh, walk behind the funerals and scream and holler and wail. OK, we're not supposed to do that. You know, everything we do with Muslims, we do with dignity. So we're to have dignity before Allah when dealing with the dead. Does everybody understand that? You know, everything we should do should be dignified. And when remembering Allah, you know, people who are loud in the presence of others when remembering Allah are people who are showing off. And again, the prophet warned us against the hidden shirk, shirk el askar, the hidden shirk. He said it sneaks up on you. You will think you are doing a deed for the sake of Allah when in reality you're doing it to impress the people around you. So when we recite the Quran, we should move our lips, but recite it in a low tone so that no one else can hear you. So that way your personal jinn does not tempt you to show off. When you're praying, you know, in the public, you know, do it in a low tone so that the people don't think you're showing off. So this is why when we do actions of remembrance, we should do it in a low tone. You know, when you make dua, you supplicate in a low tone so only you can hear because it prevents you from showing off. And on the battlefield, the same. On the battlefield, being loud leads to showing off again. Are you fighting for the sake of Allah? Or are you trying to impress the king? Are you fighting for the sake of Allah? Or do you want the prophet to think, oh, wow, you know, he's a good man. Let me make him a governor. So again, certain things we should do quietly to prevent us from showing off, to prevent us from falling victim to our own personal demon. Does everybody understand that? You know, the hikmah, the wisdom of Allah's rules is so simple to understand. We just have to learn them. Okay, and that brings us to question number two. A funeral was given for a deceased brother who was very popular. After the prayer, his family set off Chinese lanterns in honor of him. Is this permissible in Islam? Who would like to answer that? And this happens a lot. At the end of a funeral, they'll take those um, uh, lanterns and they'll let them off and, and with lights in them and they float in the sky. That's what those Chinese lanterns are. You see it a lot now at the funerals. Is this permissible? Would anyone like to answer that? Again, 
Sister Awa, Sister Anissa, Sister Faiza, Sister Hawa, Sister Ikra, Sister Kim, Sister Latifa, Brother Muhammad, Sister Sabrine, Brother Tarek, Sister Yasmin, Zaytun. I'm calling off the names so y'all can see people are here. Why are they not answering? Let's get busy. This is a simple question with a simple answer. Are we allowed to set off a lights and stuff and balloons oh. and stuff? Even a balloon. Can I let no. set balloons off in honor of a deceased? Is this permissible? No, no, that is not permissible. And I, uh, I, I don't remember Hadith, but I prophesied so Islam did not do this. So it's not a sunnah. That's something we just don't do. A feeling, a feeling to be dignified, it should follow the procedures of our Prophet of Islam. Exactly. That's the Dalil. She gave the Dalil and don't even know she gave it. No. When it comes to actions of worship, they must be done, be performed the way the Prophet did. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbade us from burning torches and setting off lanterns as the Kafir do. So this is not to be done. And if there's a lot of Muslims out there, you know, someone dies, they go to their graves and put balloons and set off balloons. We don't do this. This is shirk. This is associating partners with a law, guys. And if you're a person that does that, if you don't stop and repent before you die, before a law takes your soul, you may die on, on shaky grounds with the law. Again, there are certain sins that we commit that can destroy our belief system if we die upon them. So we don't do that. We don't set off lanterns, torches, lights, balloons, none of that stuff. We don't do that as Muslims. Or the prophet forbade that stuff. Okay, and that brings us to question number three. When should a person sit if accompanying or following the funeral procession? When should you sit down if you're following a funeral? You should not sit. Alaykum. Wa alaykum salam. Go Prophet, ahead, Sabrina. Prophet Muhammad taught us to that we are to stand until the coffin has been put on the ground. Exactly. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to stand until the coffin is placed on the ground. Good job. That's how you remember Dalil. Good job, Sabrine. Nothing else to say. Now, a lot of people ask about that hadith, how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to stand whenever a funeral would pass by, you know, out of respect for the Jews and Christians, but that was abrogated. That hadith was canceled out when the Jews and Christians broke their peace treaty with the Prophet. He said, I used to tell you to stand for the funerals uh, and then sit down until they don't sit till they pass. He said, now I'm abrogating that. You stand and don't sit until the coffin is put in the ground. So if a funeral is walking past you, you don't have to stand. But if the, you're uh, following the funeral and the coffin is put on the ground, then you that's when you sit. So that's the difference between Bukhari and Muslim. Imam Muslim included many hadiths that were abrogated. And a lot of Muslims become confused. Those hadiths are authentic, but they were canceled out. You don't have to do those things anymore. Just like standing while drinking. There are a lot of Muslims that think you cannot drink or eat while standing. That's another abrogated hadith. Imam Muslim put that in his collection. Okay, well, we have the authentic hadith from Sahih Bukhari, where Ali came upon the people 
and he made hajj and he was given some zamzam water. He stood and drank it. He said, I know many of you think that we're supposed to sit when we drink or eat. He said, but I swear by Allah, the prophet canceled that out. So that's an abrogated hadith. You can eat and you can drink while standing. But again, you know, that's the that's why Bukhari is more authentic than even Muslim, because Imam Bukhari did not even include the abrogated hadiths in his collection. OK, so there is no confusion as to what's lawful and what isn't when you stick to Bukhari. OK, let's look at the last question. If the person leading the prayer, the funeral prayer, does something wrong or something that he should not do or something that shouldn't be done, what should you do? What's the way the prophet taught us to react? If a person, say, for example, the imam begins to uh, 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 do seven talk beers, what should you do? Anyone? Okay, uh, what one should do, you can voice your disapproval of it and continue with the funeral if you're free to do so. If not, you can just leave it as the second course. Leave it and you've done your, your job of leaving it and all the good that was good is left there and all the bad is left there when you leave it. Okay, so, she gave the answer. You can do one of two things. You can A, voice your a, a disapproval to get the person to stop, to get the person to correct or stop. Or if he refuses, you if the person refuses, if the person refuses to stop, What is wrong, then you leave. And this is why we cannot attend non-Muslim non funerals. Because the non-Muslims do all kinds of things that are haram in their funerals. From eulogizing, to singing, to dancing, to crying and wailing and screaming, to shirking. So, and they're not going to listen to you and stop because that's their way. So that's why we don't attend. We cannot sit in the company. I want you guys to remember, let me put that hadith up that this is a verse of the Quran too. Let me put this verse up here. Allah says, do not sit in the company of those who do wrong. That verse of the Quran right there is the Dalil that we cannot attend uh, uh, Catholic funerals and we can't even attend a Muslim funeral and stay if the person is shirking or if the person is doing something that contradicts what the prophet taught us to do. You get up and leave. You try to correct him. He continues on doing it. Then you say, okay, I'll make my supplications at home. Because you don't have to make the supplications for the deceased person at the cemetery. You can make supplications for that deceased person at home. You can even do your own funeral at home. So we don't sit in the presence of those people who disobey a law. We don't sit in the company of those who disobey the prophet either. Everybody understand that? Okay, so mashallah, uh, uh, those were the, uh, and thank you, Anissa, because no one else except Sabrine attempted to answer any questions here, which is very discouraging. And I wish you guys here at, uh, on the Zoom room would get it together. You have to stop being afraid. The only thing that any of you should fear is a law. You should not fear Layla Nasheba. Uh, and so that because you fear me, you don't even try to answer the questions. Because when you guys don't answer the questions, you're hurting yourself. You're not going to learn anything. 
Anissa tries to answer and before she get used to get a lot of them wrong and I was hard on her but look at her now she ain't getting them wrong today. When your teacher corrects you that makes you better that makes you remember the Dalil like she remembered today like Sabrine did so you guys are gonna have to get up off your rockers here in the zoom room and start answering these questions don't depend on anisa don't sit there thinking isra gonna hold y'all or amina fresno is gonna carry it you know or precious the rest of you who i never hear from y'all gonna have to get on that microphone and start talking otherwise you're not gonna learn nothing you're gonna be one of those people who've been coming to my classes for 30 years and if i ask you what does la ilaha la mean you can't answer the people who I push, the people who I get on, they remember. When you're pushed to remember something, you don't forget it. So y'all got to do better than that as students. Okay, with that said, let's now go on to um, the PowerPoint for today, because uh, today, let me put it up here. We're going to speak about the Islamic burial. And let me go on here and uh, mute people because all that noise in the background. Please people in this Zoom room, don't turn y'all's mics on when I'm doing a lecture because you may not can hear it, but not only do we hear you breathing, we hear you walking, we hear you talking, we hear your noise and it's unprofessional on the recordings and people complain. They don't want to hear all that when they listen to a lecture. The all they want to hear is Layla. Okay, so don't put them mics back on. Okay, so we're going to talk about the Islamic burial today. We've covered the Islamic funeral from A to Z. So the next place to go with this series is to the burial. And let me remind everyone, um, um, don't forget if you go to our YouTube, my YouTube channel, Leila Nasheba's YouTube channel, if you click on the playlist called it's, uh, of this playlist, which is of sickness and death, there's also a video of Dr. Jermali and his wife showing you how to wash a deceased person and shroud them. Okay, well now we're gonna go into the burial, how a Muslim is to be buried. And I want every Muslim to understand a law makes the laws and the rules, not me, not Sheikh Elbani, not Sheikh Kamadam a dozen, not Sheikh Morsi. A law makes the laws of Islam, and burying our dead is a collective obligation in Islam. It's a serious thing that a Muslim dies and no one buries him, especially if you're one of those Muslims with the with whose Akita or belief system is so messed up that you think because a Muslim died upon a sin, he's a Kafir. And it doesn't make sense because it, Allah tells us not only do we bury our dead, but we bury the Kafirs too. So how do you justify a, a burying a Kafir, but here a person is a Muslim who died believing la ilaha illallah, but because he or she committed a sin, you think you a law now. So you can say, leave him on the dirt, dirt on the ground, leave him dead on the street. Allah says, in the interpretation of the meaning, have we not caused the earth to hold within itself the living and the dead? So this verse of the Quran is the evidence, is the evidence, is the evidence that burying a Muslim is an obligation. And if we don't do it, Every Muslim in that city is going to be held accountable by a law. Does everyone understand that? 
like the prophet said, the prophet uh, uh, buried Muslims who committed all kinds of sins, adultery, fornication, even suicide. And suicide is a sin of disbelief. But the prophet told the people, bury him. So I don't know where we get these wayward, and that's the correct term to use, wayward Muslims today who don't understand the basics of Islam, who think that they can leave a Muslim dead on the street because that Muslim didn't pray or that Muslim didn't wear a hijab. But we can go to that Kafir woman and pick her up and she didn't even believe in Allah and bury her. And this verse of the Quran is the Adalil that lets it be known that it's a collective obligation upon every Muslim in that city to bury a, what, whoever dies Muslim. Does everybody understand that? People don't, then they got problems with their Akita. Okay, so, however, there are rules that Allah has put in effect for us. Number one, a lot of people ask, Sister Layla, do we have to bury the dead in the daytime? Can I bury a person at night? What if somebody died at night? Well, yes you can you can and there's now by the way um i was given this question uh from facebook today i saw it they said uh sister layla can you settle an argument for us my cousin says that it is haram for us to bury a person at night we have to bury the person in the daytime can you settle this dispute for us well here's the hadith the prophet already settled that. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam buried a man at night. And this was a man who used to remember Allah during the night. Also, for those of you who don't know, and this is a big problem, most Muslims today, not only do they not know anything about the prophet, but they don't know anything about the companions. Fatima. The daughter of the prophet, she was buried at night. She died six months after her father. She was so sad about her father's death that she died of a broken heart six months after him. And her husband, Ali, buried her at night. If you guys knew the Sunnah, learned the Hadiths instead of learning how to sing the Quran, Singing the Quran ain't going to help you do nothing, especially when you don't even know what you're singing. But if you learn them hadith, you'd understand the Quran, whether you can sing it or not. And if Muslims would learn the hadith, they wouldn't, wouldn't have these idiotic views because it's right there. The hadith tells you how it goes into detail about Fatima's death and how Ali buried her at night. Also, my mentor, Aisha, was buried at night. Also, Abu Bakr was buried at night. And Uthman, I gave you guys the story of Uthman. When Uthman was murdered and thrown, his body thrown in the grave of the Kafirs, it was Ali's sons that dug his body up at night and buried him in the Muslim grave at night. So again, a lot of the arguments that Muslims have about Islam today are so silly. A person of knowledge such as myself, a person of knowledge such as Dr. Jamali or Sheikh Morsi, we sit back and be like, these people are just ignorant. You know, this stuff is clear. The Prophet Muhammad taught us everything we need to know about how to live how to live, how to die, how to eat, how to sleep, how to dress, how to walk, how to talk, you know? But then again, we're educated. We've spent all of our lives learning Islam and in turn, practicing it. And that's the problem. A lot of Muslims today don't practice Islam. So even if you were taught these hadiths when you were young, you forget them. 
You don't know anything about Aisha? Aisha was buried at night. I could tell any, Abu Bakr, Uthman. This, you learn this stuff as a child. So why are Muslims arguing over simple things like that? Okay, so there's nothing wrong uh, that answers the sister's question and the brother question that was arguing about it. There's your evidence. Also, there's another hadith. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went into a grave one night and he was given a lamp. He lifted the body from the side and turned it toward the Qibla saying, may Allah be merciful to you. You used to cry a lot and read the Quran a lot. And then the prophet gave four talk beer. This is for the man who was buried at night. This man used to be heard was reciting the Quran at nighttime. When other people slept, he'd go home. Uh, most of the companions, for those of you who don't know, they had a mosque built onto their house. Everybody had a mosque. They would make their homes and attach a mosque to it. And this one brother could be heard every night at three in the morning when other people were sleeping, they could hear him, you know, praying and reciting the Quran. So the prophet buried him at night because he used to remember Allah at night. What a beautiful thing. So again, but this is basic information for those of us of knowledge. But many of you've never heard these hadiths because you've never learned the hadith. You never studied anything about the prophet of companions. You may have learned to see the Quran. But if I were to ask you, what does the Quran mean? You won't know. That's sad, but this is what the prophet said would happen. Islam would become this way, distorted, okay? So there's nothing wrong with burying a person at night. However, when it comes to burying a person at sunrise or sunset, or when the sun is at its zenith, we avoid these times unless the body is uh, decomposing. The reason being because the Islam, the Allah forbids us to pray at sunrise to pray at sunset and to pray when the sun is at a zenith because these are the three times during the day that shaitan stands in front of the sun because the sun, the, there's a lot of people that worship the sun and the moon and they pray to the sun when the sun is setting, you know? So every day at sunrise, sunset and zenith, shaitan himself, Iblis himself stands in front of the, the sun with his horns because he wants to be worshipped so that all those idiots who worship the sun can worship him. So we don't pray during those times and we don't do a funeral prayer during those times either unless the body is decomposing real bad. In the event of the body decomposing, then we can offer the prayer for the, uh, the funeral prayer for that person at that time. And where's my evidence? Of course, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbade us from offering prayer or burying our dead at sunrise, at when the sun was in its zenith, or when the sun was setting. Okay, so again, but if the body is going to decompose, then that's different. Okay, remember the prerequisites, the prerequisites for the funeral prayer are the same as they are for our regular prayers. Remember, we talked about that. Okay, also, when digging the grave, we dig our graves deep. And the purpose of us burying our dead is to hide the body in a pit to prevent it from stinking and from making the, the, the atmosphere foul. And also to prevent that person from being eaten by beasts cause wolves and other animals, even a cat will dig up a grave, dig up the earth and eat what's in it. Okay, 
So this is why a law commands us that when we bury our dead to make the hole deep so that the, none of this will happen. And it is recommended to make the depth of the grave equal to the height of the person, okay? And this is based on a hadith from Hisham who said, we complain to the prophet on the day of the battle of Uhud. We said, oh, prophet of Allah, digging a separate grave for everyone is a very hard job. We got a lot of dead people to bury. This is kind of hard. The prophet then said, okay, then dig deep and put two or three bodies in each grave. And the companion said, well, if we put two or three in one grave, who should we put in first? The prophet said, put the one who memorized the most Quran in first. Okay, so you learn a lot from that hadith. Not only do you learn that our graves should be dug deep, but also you can put two or three people in one grave. And this was a question that was presented to me and Sheikh Morsi uh, years ago when they had the war in Bosnia. So many Bosnians were killed and uh, they didn't have enough graves. And I remember one of the brothers from Bosnia came here and asked uh, Sheikh Morsi and myself, uh, he said, can they, we put two or three people in a grave? And, the, and Sheikh Morsi told him, of course, yes. And Sheikh Morsi gave him this hadith, okay? So, you know, that you learn both of those points from that authentic hadith there. And also, it's best to build a laud, a laud. And I tried to show a picture of it. A laud is a niche dug at the bottom of the grave to place the body in. And uh, it's a crevice on the side. You can, I want hope, don't know if you can see it good here. It's a crevice on the side of the grave facing the direction of the Qibla which is covered with unburnt bricks like a house or a roof. A regular grave is just a pit dug in the, in the ground, but the Lord is a pit dug, but it goes off to the side like a roof where the person, and then it's sealed off. You could do either one, okay, either one. We have the hadith here, whereas when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died, there were two grave diggers. One usually dug the lahat, and the other did just a regular grave. The companion said, let us seek guidance from Allah as to what type of grave to give the Prophet. Then they asked each of them to dig a grave, and they decided the grave of the one who finished first would be the one they would bury the prophet in, and the one who finished first was the one who dug the lahat. So they buried the, the prophet in a lahat. So and now that's what people do. I know here where I live, uh, the Muslims have their own cemetery. So the brother that digs the grave here, from what I understand, he's able to make it, and he digs the deep hole and he put digs off to the side to give the person a lahat okay so you know but either one is acceptable but if you can do the lahat that would be better it depends on your grave diggers okay and so that brings us to the next question how is the body placed in the grave well it is from the sunnah of our prophet to place a body in the grave with the feet first, if it's possible. And this is based on a hadith, whereas Abdullah ibn Zayd, the son of Zayd, placed a body with his feet in first and said, this is what the prophet did. If it's not easy to do that, then you put the body in the grave however you can. Does everybody understand that? So we, you know, if you are able to put the deceased body in feet first. Now here in America, different states have different regulations. Some states do not allow you to place a body in a grave without a coffin. So what they do is if you have to have the body in a coffin, they'll put the feet in first. They'll take the, the bottom part of the coffin where the feet is 
and put it down first, okay? But if you are in a state that allows you to put the body in without a coffin, then they do the feet first. This is from the Sunnah of our prophet. And remember, we follow the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad. We don't follow no Sunnah of no Sheikh or nobody else. You don't follow Layla Sunnah. You don't follow Jamali Sunnah. You don't follow Bin Baz Sunnah. You follow the Prophet Muhammad's Sunnah. Understand that, Muslims? If you follow anybody Sunnah but his, you got a problem. That means your belief system is not correct. And that means you ain't no believing Muslim. Check that belief system. Okay. All right. Also, when you place the body in, you try to uh, put it facing the Kibla. And once the body has been placed in the hole, that's when we pray for the deceased and you loosen the shroud okay and usually what they do is when they place the, the the body in the grave the person that does it says allahu akbar and it and bismillah they'll say bismillah which means in the name of allah and in and in accordance with the tradition of the prophet and then they will loosen the shroud Ibn Umar said that when a body was placed in the grave, the prophet used to say, Bismillah. He used to say, in the name of Allah, and in accordance with the tradition of Allah's messenger or the practice of Allah's messenger. So that's what the Imam is saying. A lot of people ask me, Sister Layla, what is it that the Imam says when he puts the, the, the body in the grave? That's what he's saying in English. That's what he's saying, you know, if he's a man of the Sunnah. If you come from a mosque of the Sunnah that follows the Sunnah, that's what your Imam is saying when he's putting the body in the grave. He's saying in the name of Allah and the way that the prophet taught us to do. Because there's so many innovations today, we're following the Sunnah of the prophet, not anyone else's. And also putting a pillow is, is something that we don't do. It's extremely disliked. And I threw this in here because one of the brothers told me uh, that he was told uh, that he should put a pillow in the grave for the person's head to rest on. Uh, no, no. In fact, here's my evidence. Umar told his inheritors. He said, after having placed my body in the grave, leave my face open to the dirt. Also, Adah, in his will, he gave instructions that his shroud should be untied, as the prophet used to do, and his cheek should be exposed to the dirt. Also, there's nothing wrong with putting bricks or rocks or soul to support the body so that it is not flat on his back. There's nothing wrong with that. So if you're going to put some brick, if you're putting a body in there, you want to put uh, dirt or stones or bricks to support his back. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Also, there's nothing wrong with throwing three handfuls of dirt over the grave. This is based on a hadith by Ibn Majah. He says the prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once offered a funeral prayer and went to the deceased's grave and threw three handfuls of dirt near the deceased's head. So there is nothing wrong with that. When you see Muslims doing that, there is nothing wrong with that. And then after the person is buried, that's when we pray for them. Uthman tells us after the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was buried, I mean, after any burial, the prophet would stand by the grave of the deceased and he would say to us, seek forgiveness for your brother and pray for his acceptance because he is now being questioned. Because I'm telling you, the punishment of the grave and the questioning of the grave happens immediately. That's why I say we, for those sinful Muslims, those Muslims who are kidas messed up, boy, you better hope you don't die no time soon. 
Because once your body hit that grave, it's over. You now in a whole different world. And you now get ready to get questioned about everything you did in this world, everything you said in this world, everything you didn't do in this world, okay? So that's why the people who put you in that grave, once they bury you, they'll make do it for you. And again, uh, Ibn Umar, he used to recite the first and last few verses of Surat al-Baqarah by the grave after the burial was over. This is what Ibn Umar would do, you know? And uh, uh, um, after the, the uh, Ali, after a person was buried, Ali used to say, oh Allah, this is your servant who is now a guest of yours and you are the best host. Forgive him and expand the entrance into heaven for him. Okay, so these are the things taught for us to do in regards to the burial by our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's very important that you Muslims listening to me, and it's not that many listening, but it's very important that you guys understand Islam is only based on two sources, the Quran and the Hadith of our prophet. The only person we seek for guidance in this religion is Allah and his prophet. We don't worship no scholars. We don't worship no sheikh. We, just because a person comes from a certain part of this world don't mean nothing, does not make them righteous. There's gonna be many people from Mecca in hell. Abu Jahal will be carrying the wood for a lot of them, okay? We only follow what Allah and the Prophet says, not any fatwas from off no Islam Q&A website or nowhere else. And again, the Prophet was detailed. He didn't forget anything. He did not forget anything. You just have to learn from the people and knowledge. Not the people who are dead, who are not here to defend themselves when you lie on them. And they didn't even speak English. You have to learn from the people of knowledge that are here now who have the true knowledge, who can back up what they say with clear evidence from the Quran and the authentic Sunnah. Does everybody understand that? These are the guidelines that our prophet taught us on burial. Now, tomorrow, what I'm gonna do is speak about some of the Sunnah things we can do. And we're gonna also talk about things that you shouldn't do in regards to the burial tomorrow. So please make sure that everybody uh, is here for that. Uh,